of you. It's especially, um, I want to give you a warm welcome if you are visiting us this morning for the first time. Welcome to Liberty Baptist. We are really glad that you joined us this morning. Um, if you are visiting, please don't leave before you fill out a visitor's card. You can get that in the pew back in front of you. Um, it gives us your name, your information, so that we can stay in contact with you and find out if there are any ways that we can better serve you. Um, but again, warm welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, yesterday and today, Railroad Festival, which means that t- uh, next, not tomorrow, next Saturday is Autumn Fest. You said that with a little more enthusiasm. Autumn Fest, next Saturday. Um, many people have volunteered, um, signed up to be volunteers next Saturday, but you can look in the Proclaimer and see that there is still a very big need for more volunteers. We have listed out there how many people we need, how many we have. Um, We still are in great need of more enthusiastic volunteers next Saturday. There are different shifts, different um, locations where you can serve. Please don't leave before you check out that list, which is on the table by um, near the front office. So please sign up to serve in some way next Saturday. Um, We also are in need of people to host trunks for Truck or Treat which is coming up in just a few weeks. We have about 50% of the chunks needed. So um, still many more volunteers needed. So um, those are the two needs that we have coming up. In regards to Autumn Fest, there is a meeting this Tuesday night, 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It's a pre-meeting. Even if you haven't signed up yet, if you have any interest in doing so, come on out to the meeting, find out more information, and then you can go from there. Well, thank you for listening now. Let's all join in worship together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. We're so glad he's in our life. We're so glad he came to save us. Let's stand together as we praise his name this morning.
Sunday morning, an opportunity for us to lift our voices and praise to you. And God, we thank you for this month of October, a month of so much ministry. God, as we get the privilege of interacting with our community, as we choose to serve in various ways, as we meet those who are not connected to your church, and God, our deep concern is they may not be connected to you. And so, God, we pray that in the midst of ministry, in the midst of service, in the midst of interaction, may you give us divine appointments to share with people who you are. May we see, even this month, people come to faith in you. God, as we uh, help this afternoon in cleaning up at the Railroad Festival, as we minister to uh, and give an opportunity to interact uh, next weekend with so many as we minister to the children here at the end of the month. God, we just pray that, that these acts of ministry would result in a spiritual harvest. And so would you keep us sensitive to the people that you bring in our path? Would you help us to express words, uh, to express actions that would glorify you? And God, today as we open your word, God, we pray that you would uh, help us live well with one another. And may we follow the commands of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
as we walk together in unity. We need to remember that God is all to us. Jesus is all to us. Let's stand together as we sing about that unity. Only so. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Bless the Lord, all His works, in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bow with me in prayer, please. Our Father and our God, we do bless Your name as we come before You this morning. Father, we want to lift Your name on high. Lord, Thank you. Thank you for life, for giving us physical life. Thank you for creating us, Father. Thank you for sustaining us with reasonable health. Father, thank you for redeeming our souls from sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What a joy it is, Lord, to worship with these, your people, this day, to sing the songs of Zion, to lift our hands in praise to you, to call out to you in prayer, Lord, and to know that we have your attention, Father, that you're listening. Father, that you're more than listening. You're inclining your ear toward us. What is man that thou art mindful of us? What is man that thou would desire to fellowship with us? Lord, we praise your name. Bless your name. And Father, as we come to this precious time of worship, when we bring our treasures, our tithes, our gifts, our presents, our sacrifices to you, Lord, we pray that you'd bless this moment. Father, Teach us how to worship through giving. Lord, it's all yours. Scripture tells us you own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all yours. Make us aware of that truth, Holy Spirit, deep in our hearts. Father, we thank you for this offer, and I ask you to bless it. Bless our time as we continue to worship together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. got one in mind? Well, the song I'm sharing this morning um, was written by uh, the group, I was going to say for him, but that's not it, um, Phillips, Craig, and Dean, and boy, they put a mouthful of words, which I'll try to keep up with this morning, 
But listen to the lyrics. What do you think God's favorite song of all is? Well, he loves to hear the wind sing as it whistles through the pines and mountain leaves. And he loves to hear the raindrops as they splash to the ground in majestic melody. He smiles in sweet approval as the waves crash through the rocks in harmony. And creation joins in unity to sing to him majestic symphonies. But his favorite song of all Sinners now made clean, lift their voices loud and strong, when those purchased by His blood, live to Him a song of love, nothing more He'd rather hear, none so sweetly to His ear, as His favorite song. And he loves to hear the angels as they sing, Holy, holy is the Lamb. Holy is the Lamb. Heaven's choirs in harmony with the praises to the great I am. As a newborn soul sings, I have been redeemed. And his favorite song of all, it's the song of the redeemed. When lost sinners now make clean, lift their voices loud and strong. When the first Today I start a new message series simply entitled, One Another, uh, with a subtitle that probably is equally as important as the main title, Christian Civility in a Cruel World. This 
brief message series, only a few weeks long, bringing us right up to Thanksgiving, which is not too far away, focuses just on a few passages of Scripture that all share one simple thing in common. It's actually one Greek word, but it comes to two English words, and that is the phrase, one another. These few phrases that appear in our English Bibles give us a sense of how we are to have proper treatment of one another. You know, I want to stay at the beginning of this very short series, even though I think it is very important, is that it feels to me that we must be reminded that you don't get civilization without civility. There seems to be a lie that is being propagated and propagated again and again that we can say whatever we want, we can do whatever we want, we can treat people however we want, and the fabric of society will not be ultimately pulled to the place of becoming unrepairable. You know, I think one of the waning realities of a Judeo-Christian ethic, even in our own country, is the poor treatment of one another. And I cannot affect the world, but I certainly can speak with a clear voice to Christians. And I will just say Christians have a moral obligation as a follower of Jesus to live and act a certain way in the world. We might have forgotten that the opposite of civility is anarchy. And I would say that for any person who's actually lived in a place, which you haven't and I haven't, where that becomes the norm, you may desire to hear of a deeper level what I am actually trying to say. Civility is more than just about politeness, although that's certainly a necessary first step. Being civil means one chooses out of a deep conviction to speak, interact, and act in a way that supports the good of other people. Civility is the hard work, and it is hard work. We should not forget this. It is the hard work of living well with one another. It is disagreeing without becoming disagreeable, seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences, listening past one's preconceptions. And here's something, the reason I'm doing this series is teaching others, especially under the cross, to do the same Civility is the hard work of staying present, even with those whom we have deep-rooted and even fierce disagreements. There are some times in my life that I get somewhat irritated that I have to address particular subjects. And I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm a bit irritated that I even have to address this subject. I mean, the way I thought about this is this is what I should have teach James by the time he's about eight. And if he doesn't figure this out by about eight, there'll be consequences to bear about how you just play nice with one another. This is what I thought we would learn in second grade and third grade and fourth grade. It'd be reinforced by fifth grade, getting along, playing well, living well with one another. And yet... Uh, I feel as though this series has been almost pressed upon me. Uh, I feel like I'm almost, I, I do feel that now I have a moral obligation to speak on the idea of Christian civility. There was uh, a man, actually this series was born out of a very brief conversation I had with a very influential Christian leader. And I asked him what he was reading and what he was thinking about. And he says he was reading a, a, a now retired theologian by the name of Richard Mao, who had coined the term convicted civility. He says, this is what our churches need. And this appears to be what our culture needs. This idea of convicted civility. 
Richard Mao also wrote another book called Uncommon Decency. It used to be common decency, but now decency is not common decency. Unfortunately, it is uncommon decency. Um, and so, I can only tell the non-Christian world that they ought to think about the type of world they are creating by jettisoning civility. But to the Christian world, who decides they don't want to be civil anymore because everybody else is being uncivil, I call the Christian community to deep and profound repentance. There is never an excuse to be ungodly. There are some things you never say. There are some ways you never act. Because as a Christian, you are obligated by Jesus of Nazareth to live and act as a certain way in the world. It's sad to me that the faceless world of social media has revealed the deep and profound darkness of the human soul. How we can say whatever we want and act in whatever we want, but I will just say you're going to get something in time you don't want. And I think the world that we're already getting is one that we probably won't want. You say, is this this big of a deal? Do other people see the crisis of our culture rejecting civility itself? Uh, I, was, I, I do limit the news that I watch because I just don't want to see most of it. But one thing perked my attention uh, that UCLA, uh, the University of, of California in Los Angeles, received a $20 million donation. And, and two folks, Jennifer and Matthew Harris, donated $20 million for one specific purpose, to open the Kindness Institute. That they felt like the topic that needed the most study and to figure out what was going on was why in the world were we, be, were we being so unkind to one another and to actually do a study on how to be kind, to express kindness in greater ways. They said their $20 million donation will support world-class research on kindness to create opportunities to translate that research into real-world practices and to serve as a global platform to educate and communicate its findings. I do know a Christian man who worked at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, for years did research on forgiveness. And I will say some of the findings that came out of that were the best that I have seen about best practices to embody forgiveness in tough situations. So I'll keep up on what they find out. But I think, uh, I don't want to say I could save them $20 million, but I probably could by just readdressing the ethic of the New Testament and applying that into real life. Uh, We'll take a lot less than that, and we'll practice kindness. Um, but doesn't that just show the state of things? That in our age of in progressing in so many areas, the area that we are neglecting, the area of virtue, will be the area that may harm us the most. If you have a Bible, let's... So here's the first simple message. You ready for it? Live at peace with one another. Boy, that sounds so simple, doesn't it? Sounds so basic. Live in harmony with one another. And this is going to be the one another command we focus on today. Here's my first point. To live at peace with one another, we must be humble enough not to think we are always right. Even to those of you who are always right, you must be humble enough to think that you might not be in this one rare situation. <laughs> Verse 16 says, the laughter tells a big tale, I will just say. Uh, and, and there was a lot of laughing, which means, God help us. Um, <laughs> Verse 16 says, be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise 
in your own estimation. So here's our first phrase. We're going to have to work on it just a little bit. The simple idea here is a virtue that underlies Christian civility is humility. And notice all of these are woven together quite nicely. Uh, This first opening line, live at harmony, live at peace, be in agreement, think the same way towards one another, they all convey this similar idea. The call here in uh, Romans 12 verse 16 is not for agreement, but for agreeableness, to be in agreement. Or this idea to think uh, the same, the idea is not to think the same thing towards one another, but to, but to, to think the same way towards one another. These are basic rules of interaction that we ought to possess a posture, a respect for the person uh, has to be uttermost, and that we think in a certain way uh, that no matter what we're talking about, the person's worth and value, the in, innate respect that we owe the person is uttermost in one's conversation. So respect for the person and then humility of one's own thoughts about a given issue. I can't impress enough how has it become that, that we will become, and this is, this, is, this is no respecter of persons, it seems, in our culture. Uh, religious people think they're absolutely right. Non-religious people think they're absolutely right. And the question becomes, where's the virtue of humility? I certainly have strong and profound convictions. I don't get pushed around quite easily. But humility should reign. I have been wrong, I would propose, as many times as I have been right in a given situation. And could it be that the opposite of humility, let's get straight with it, is pride. Thus the reason, be in agreement with one another, do not be Proud. It's a very straightforward statement. And then as if, uh, as if that wasn't enough, associate with the humble. And if that wasn't enough, don't be wise in your own estimation. There is the, the cascading explanation here in this uh, moment. Humility requires self-reflection to think around your own thoughts. Respect for the person in front of me and the ability not just to destroy the person's argument, but to have the ability to think around one's own thoughts, allowing for listening, evaluating, for appropriate conversation, for disagreement, but ultimately agreeableness. Now, I will just state, as I go through this series, I'm going to state some things that we must choose to do. I would say that our culture at large is choosing not to do these things. But we must choose humble agreeableness. We must choose it. It doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. That's not the way the world works. But we must choose humble agreeableness. I rather think, now when we put it that baldly, we have chosen prideful disagreements. Think about it. Humble agreeableness or prideful disagreeableness. And this is, these, are, these are things we must choose. They're so simple. But they're things that you must form a conviction about. Because we can, there's nothing in this series that's too hard for anybody to understand. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's an emotional one. It's a spiritual one. We all know what the right thing is to do. It's just getting right down to doing it in real life situations. Emotions flare and pride appears and all the virtue can go away. And I will just say for the Christian, deep and profound repentance is needed at that moment. The second idea here is to live at peace with one another. We must not engage in retaliation. Verse 17 Paul here, reflecting deeply on the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. 
The idea here is de-escalation and resisting retaliation. It is amazing how quickly a small situation can turn into a big situation. And so the Christian is one who works on de-escalation. Now Paul is reflecting deeply on Jesus because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard it says, an eye for an eye. Now actually, that phraseology, an eye for an eye, was a, was a means by which to hold down escalation because it was only one eye for one eye. Because I don't know, at least in college, we would play pranks on each other. Well, if you start playing pranks on one another, uh, somebody has to de-escalate the situation because one prank leads to a bigger prank, it leads to a bigger prank, it leads to a bigger... And then before you know it, it's, it is a big situation. And somebody has to say, okay, I think we can't keep this up. So, so Jesus is the one who says, an eye for an eye. And yet, once we get to the New Testament, there's an even deeper call for de-escalation. Um, so you can choose to live life one of two ways. You can choose for every time you see wrong happen, you can try to get even. Now, and I would again say that I see that is the default for many people. Every time they see a wrong, they've got to address it right there. Repay evil for evil. Now look, at the essence of good charity work, okay, which is Paul's next phrase, try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes rather than living your life to say, you did this wrong to me and I'm going to do this wrong to you. A, a more mature person, a more spiritual person, is actually going to assess the evils of the world. I am not sticking my head in the sand of how many negative and terrible things there are happening in the world. But why not do something positive to address an evil? These are the essence of good charities. They say, well, people are stealing from one another and that's making this group of people disenfranchised. That's an example. Well, you can spend your whole life fussing or you can do something positive to address this problem. Now, P Paul is talking here about Christian witness. Which one looks better on our witness? Every, to repay evil for evil? You did this to me, I did this to you. Or as a Christian to say, this is the essence of our ministries, to identify an evil in the world and to organize in a positive way to address it in a non-retaliatory manner. Would that be better? See, that requires uh, stepping back from the situation to do this. It doesn't mean that you don't address the, the, the negative of the world. You just choose not to be vindictive, and you actually try to do good to get to the heart of the problem. And this is, and this is more honorable in everyone's eyes. So, here's the other thing we have to choose. We must choose not to be vindictive. We must choose to do good to address evil things, problems in the world. The third major point is to live at peace with one another. We must pursue peacemaking behaviors. Uh, verse 18 says, if possible, on your part, Live at peace with everyone. Now, clear, clearly, clearly again, Paul is referencing the great ethic of Jesus. At the start of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Again, so simple, peacemaking activities. But I would say that we have embodied, Blessed are the conflict makers, for they shall ultimately win. This is the ethic of our day, if you don't notice. So there is a sense in which peacemaking has to be a part of things. Uh, you ought to go out of your way to try to bring stability and peace to a situation. Is it always possible? 
No, sometimes conflict gets out of control beyond which you can handle. But the New Testament ethic is, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. You ought to look for a position of peace with people. Uh, I've actually heard a few folks <laughs> working up to a situation and they said, boy, I'm going to set this situation on fire. I thought, good day. Are you crazy? Why would we do that? Why would you act this way? Why would you goad in a situation? That is never allowable for the Christian. If possible, on your part, Live at peace with everyone. And then lastly, to live at peace with one another. And I think this is going to be our hardest one. We must continue to express kindness even when the world around us is unkind. And this is, this is our rationale. If we, if we don't be hostile to a hostile world, then, then justice won't be served. Do you know how atheistic that view is? If I don't give them what they deserve, they'll never get what they deserve. Do you know how atheistic that position is? Because the last time I checked, the judge of all the earth stands at the door. And I will just say, by embodying peace, it does not mean I'm not concerned about justice. And I will just say, I can't, I can't imagine that the God of justice who looks down over the situation is, is real pleased at the injustice that reigns. But this is not my responsibility in every moment. Notice verse 19. It says, friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's or His wrath. For it is written, vengeance, is my, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20 says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, for in so doing rather, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil. Boy, a strong statement. But conquer evil with good. So here is the idea of kindness in hostility. May I just say, and you need to hear this, because this is the hardest ethic to follow. Jesus follows this same line of thought, where if someone wants your coat, give them your shirt, go the extra mile. Paul is reiterating again the ethic of Jesus in this particular text. So could we get within the mind of God, because this, this few verses talks about God's judgment, and actually God's judgment increasing in our kindness, if you read, read the text. Um, and so here's the way it goes. When we get in, in a conflict with another person, we often give our enemy or our opponent a justification for their behavior. Everybody right now seems to be justi justifying their behavior based on the actions of the other person. So watch how this goes. So if my enemy or my opponent does something to me, if I act equally ungodly as them, what do they say? See, he deserved it. He should have got what he, I mean, look at him. He's acting crazy. I'm acting crazy. We're both acting crazy. And now this whole situation has grown terribly hostile. But God says, wait a minute. By the way, this is most perfectly embodied in Jesus. No one was more kind and gentle in hostility than Jesus. As they led him to the cross, 
he expressed profound control and even kindness. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Working to, to bring the, the thief on the cross with him into paradise. No one exhibited hostility in kindness more than Jesus, by the way. He is the example of this in this moment. So if my opponent, and by the way, this worked for Jesus in his life, it works for Christians if we follow his example. If my opponent wants to justify their bad behavior. So if, if they attack me, and I just, even if I just merely choose not to respond, sometimes they can make them more mad. You understand how this goes? And then, again, another assault, and rather than repay evil for evil, you repay evil with good. You give no criterion on which the opponent can say, you're the problem. Even though they may continue to say this, the facts will tell a different tale. And here's the idea. Jesus embodied this because the more innocent the sufferer, the best chance the enemy has to see who? Himself. You track with this? It gives the person the greatest opportunity to say, you know what, I've been laying into this person and they have yet to say one negative thing to me. They have yet to retaliate in one negative way. And it at least gives them the opportunity for self-reflection to say, you know what, the problem in this situation might be me. That's exactly what happened with Jesus in some situations. However, if even in a non-retaliatory situation, a person continues to act unjustly, even when the one that is against them is not retaliating, God says in that situation, if you don't get the memo to repent in that situation, I'll deal with you. You understand this? If you won't see yourself, because God's ultimate desire is not to judge, but to save. The ultimate move would be for the uncivil person to say, I am prideful. I am hostile. I need God to intervene in my life. You understand? That's the ultimate. But if the person doesn't, Paul says the acts of kindness will not go unnoticed before God. They will be exhibit one on judgment day against such a person. You understand this? Maybe this is a little bit too mind-bending for you. But the best opportunity for a person to see themselves in a hostile situation is you give them no excuse. You give them no justification for continuing their bad behavior. The Christian is to, is to express profound kindness in hostility so hopefully the enemy will become repentant and ultimately will find the help that they need in this particular situation. The final thing we must choose is we must choose kindness even to our enemies. That's what we must choose. And I will just say, Think about it. We must choose humble agreeableness. Got to be on the list. We must, we must choose to not be vindictive. We must choose to be peacemakers. We must choose, even in the midst of hostility, to never give justification for our own hostility, but rather kindness. These are simple truths but one in which we desperately need the help of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, spiritual disciplines to live out. The deep struggle of human interaction, which we see before us, is actually a deeper struggle. It's the struggle of the human heart. And so I would just, you would just say, well, what, what is my first step in a cruel world? What do I do? How, how do I 
affect change? Well, the first thing you do is get your own self right with God. And some of you today see sin all around you, but you failed to do one very important thing. Admit that you too are a sinner. That's where we start. And say to God, I need your cross and I need your salvation. Some of you today are not Christians. Some of you today have never surrendered your life to Jesus. You wonder how the problems of the world are going to be solved. Well, they're not going to be solved by you. They're going to be solved by God, starting with you, trusting in Him. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the altar is open. And I, I don't want you to brush aside this simple message. Christians, I want you to ponder one simple thought. Do you possess the conviction of Christian civility? And do you possess the conviction to live out the necessities of Christian civility in your own life? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you. God, we pray for one another. God, we pray that, that we would embody the deepest command that you've given for human interaction, and that is love one another as you have loved us. And God, I, I just can't imagine that you don't grieve when you see how we treat one another. And so, God, for at least of those who are in this sanctuary today, may we not justify any behaviors that are outside the teachings of Christ. God, may you help us to possess a deep and abiding Christian civility. May we follow the words of Jesus. May we live out the truthfulness of the New Testament. And God, may we be, as you called us to be, salt and light to a world who needs to see a new way of being in the world. And so God, may our greatest witness be in the simplicity of loving one another as you have told us as you met with those disciples you said love one another and the world would know that we were your disciples may we exhibit that type of love so that the world can see you in us in Jesus name Amen